Thank you very much. So, what I have been asked to do is to uh, talk about change management, usually looking at the various uh, um, things which have had an influence on the way we deliver stroke care. And I think it's a, a great success story, um, and is one that is relevant not just to stroke, it's relevant, I think, to a whole range of chronic um, diseases. Now this is the uh, diagram, diagram of the stroke pathway, taking one through from the importance of implementing good quality care in primary prevention through the acute treatment, back out into uh, the community again, managing people with long-term disabilities and impairments, um, and then secondary prevention as well. So a complex pathway, but the one that is not um, actually specific just to stroke. Now we're starting, and I'm going to begin really with a, a description of where we've come from with stroke um, and then take you through um, the sorts of uh, drivers that have led to some improvements in stroke care uh, to where we are at the moment, which is certainly not um, perfect care, but a lot better than where we started. Now just to put into context, this was a survey done only last year in uh, Essex. Um, which uh, may or may not be representative of the rest of uh, the UK. Um, but certainly within Essex, um, there were some very other strange beliefs around still about stroke. That only half of the population thought that stroke was a, treatable disease, a preventable disease, a uh, quarter thought that it was completely untreatable. Um, and then there were some very curious beliefs around the fact that women were not likely to get strokes, that uh, stroke only affected older people, and 31% uh, of people thought that smoking didn't have any impact on causing stroke. Presumably that was the 31% of the quest people questioned who were smoking. And some of those beliefs really go back and have, um, to the time of William Osler, who writing at the end of the uh, 19th century wrote that it's the duty of the physician to explain to the patient or to his friends that the condition is past relief, that medicine and electricity will do no good, and there's no possible hope of cure. And it is really very recently that uh, people have still had that sort of philosophy um, towards stroke. I first started as a consultant uh, geriatrician at St. Thomas's Hospital um, just over 20 years ago. And at that stage, um, stroke was certainly not regarded as being a condition which needed any form of specialist care. Um, patients were admitted under any one of 17 general physicians to any one of 15 different wards. Very little happened to the patient acutely, um, apart from being taught on uh, once or twice. Brain scans were extremely difficult to obtain and therefore rarely done, and an anecdote which I uh, um, often quote is when I uh, was first started as a consultant, I wanted to have a stroke patient in. Um, I wanted a brain scan on this patient, I thought not unreasonably. Um, we sent the form down, it came back two or three days later, scrawled across it by the radiologist that scan is not indicated. Um, and uh, so I sent the registrar down after the ward round to explain in a bit more detail why I thought a scan was important and he came back half an hour later saying, well, I've really done my best. I really don't think I can persuade this man. He seemed adamant. So I thought, well, I'll go down and have a consultant, a consultant chat with him and explain why it's necessary. So I went down, walked into his office. He stood up, looked angry and hit me in the face and said, I've already explained that you're not having a scan. Now, I've not been hit um, by a radiologist in recent years, um, so that tells me that actually we are beginning to improve in terms of evidence-based medicine within the UK. Patients having not had their scans back in 1988 would then be referred on to the geriatricians for rehabilitation, often a long wait, but actually quite good quality rehabilitation when they got it. And certainly no stroke specialist service within the hospital or the community. And if you look at the way that, um, at the, that the outcomes from stroke in the UK compared to other parts of the world, um, this was back in the mid-1990s, so five or six years after I first started as a consultant, you could see that actually maybe this way we were approaching stroke care um, was actually having pretty negative impact on terms of outcome. So I'm afraid the figures are rather, the picture's rather small, but if you just look at the lower half of the, uh, the graph, um, which adjusts the outcomes for um, case severity, 
These are data from the International Stroke Trial, which was a very large trial of about 20,000 patients, um, testing to see whether giving aspirin acutely improved outcomes or not, and recruitment was for many, many different countries. And there was a post hoc analysis done on these data, looking to see if patients put into the studies from different countries had different outcomes. And the UK um, is right down at the bottom, with, as you can see, outcomes significantly worse than uh, average um, as, um, when looked at uh, death or dependency uh, six months after the, they were put into the trial. So that evidence suggests that our outcomes in the UK compared to Sweden, Argentina, which was in the middle of financial meltdown at the time, Poland, Australia, countries which one would have expected would probably not have had um, better quality outcomes were, were significantly better than the UK. So we were doing something badly wrong. And we ran a study um, from King's College London looking at the way that dif different ways that stroke care was being provided around Europe um, because this was a very interesting natural experiment. There were huge variations in the way that stroke was being delivered in the mid 1990s. So, um, if you look at uh, the way, that, for example, we visited a hospital in Budapest where which didn't have a specialist stroke unit, um, patients were managed on general medical wards. There was uh, one ward with about 100 patients on it and two nurses um, and a few conscientious objectors and very little in the way of any therapy input at that time. Um, my uh, chief executive's face lit up when I described to him that it was possible to nurse patients with two nurses and 100 patients, but uh, that's by the by. If you went to Germany, very much more intensive acute care for stroke patients. Patients would be directly admitted to a neurointensive care unit. They would have all the investigations necessary, probably more than necessary. Um, but then after the first two or three days, discharged into uh, um, generic rehabilitation and lost sight of from the neurologists. In France, much more comprehensive approach to both acute and rehabilitation, and certainly in Scandinavia, um, a model, models of care which really did appear to be addressing the whole pathway in a comprehensive fashion. So we had a number of centers in. They're listed along the bottom, some of them. And the, the solid bars are the costs of stroke adjusted for the price parity index, the US dollar, um, set against the cheapest center, which was Latvia. So as you can see, there are huge variations, or were huge variations, in the amount of money being spent on stroke, um, with the most expensive countries being predominantly um, the Scandinavian countries. But London, which is the third column from the left, was spending a very large amount of money on the, on the care being provided to patients. So it wasn't that we were being um, cheapskates on that, but it was uh, um, certainly we were spending lots. And then if you look at what impact or the outcomes in those countries, that's the vertical bars, all the dots with the, with the uh, um, hazard ratios um, attached to them. You can see the first message is if you spend very little in Lithuania, Menorca, um, Warsaw, the outcomes are pretty poor. If you spend a great deal right on the very far side, it actually does look as though outcomes are better. But in London, our outcomes where we're spending a lot are really not a lot different from some of those uh, um, poorer countries. So really quite a lot of evidence that the way that healthcare was being delivered for stroke um, in uh, the mid-1990s was pretty poor and having pretty poor outcomes. So what has led to the change? Well, the, by far the most important um, driver for change is delivering high quality evidence that people can believe. And I'm going to just illustrate the evidence argument with just two examples. First of all, the evidence showing that stroke units save lives and reduce disability, very powerful meta-analysis of uh, many trials that have been done now, clearly showing that actually if you pro provide people with organized care, then they do better with reduced mortality of about 17%, reduced death or institutionalization by about 25%. An incredibly powerful intervention, more powerful than nearly almost, en almost anything else that we have um, in modern medicine. The second example is around giving thrombolysis for stroke. And this is a summary of the uh, trials um, 
uh, for thrombolysis, clot busting treatment in stroke, showing that those patients who did not receive, who received during the control groups in these trials, had a 30% chance of being alive and independent at three months if they were treated within three hours of their onset of stroke. If they, if the control group didn't receive, obviously, but within the thrombolysis group, if they were treated within three hours of stroke, there was a 44% chance that they were going to be alive and independent. So again, a very powerful intervention, number needed to treat of about seven. So just to illustrate how this sort of treatment can, uh, uh, the sort of impact that it can have, this is a 59-year-old who arrived on a snowy day in London. It took her rather a long, longer to get into hospital. Um, because of the snow, the ambulance uh, didn't manage to get to her, and she was brought in by a colleague from work. When she came in, she had evidence of a very profound stroke with a dense left-sided weakness and all the other things that went with that. So a huge stroke, which one would have predicted probably without treatment, would have gone on and left this lady either dead or with severe disability in the long term. She had a brain scan done immediately after she came in. She had uh, the thrombolysis de delivered very quickly after she arrived and uh, within 24 hours she had made a full recovery. So that's the sort of thing that we're attempting to implement in terms of delivering evidence-based medicine in stroke. Now the, the critical thing about delivering that sort of treatment is that it needs to be done properly. And this is a slide from a study published in 2002 from centers mainly in North America where they'd introduced thrombolysis into routine practice. Um, and what stands out is that the center from Cleveland, Ohio, had a very, very high complication rate. The major complication for thrombolysis is that you can cause the stroke to become worse or the patient to die as a result of causing bleeding into the uh, infarct. And they had a 15% thromb uh, hemorrhage rate compared to the trials um, where they had rates of about 5%. And when they analyzed to see why there was that, was that huge difference, it was because the treatment was not being given um, according to the evidence of the way that it should have been given from the trials. It was being given in a rather haphazard way to the wrong people at the wrong time. So what are the problems that we needed solving? Having sort of put into context where we started from and the sorts of things that we need to be delivering, what we have uh, clearly got in the UK and worldwide is that there is unacceptable variation in the quality of care between hospitals and also in the community. And that's due to variable quality of clinical and managerial leadership and the variability in the amount of resources that are put into stroke care. The UK, I'm afraid, is universally slow in adopting new technologies. And that's certainly been true for thrombolysis. The original paper published in the mid-1990s um, from the States, the NINS trial for thrombolysis, you were seeing people introducing that treatment very quickly in some centers in North America and Europe. Really, we were, it, was, it took 10, 15 years for us to even begin to start using it in any substantial way in the UK. And we've still got the problem that there are many clinicians and many of the general public who think that stroke is an untreatable disease of old people. So just to illustrate the variability that we've got in some of the existing um, services, this is a, a graph taken from a National Audit Office report on stroke care showing the variations in length of stay. So just a simple measure of process, huge variations between uh, the hospitals with the shortest length of stay and those with the longest length of stay. This is data from the National Sentinel Audit of Stroke, which we've been running um, on a two-yearly cycle since the end of the 1990s, and I'll present more data from this in a little while. But just summarizing, each one of those dots is one of an acute, acute, an acute provider of stroke care um, with the average organizational scores um, for the, the way that they're delivering their care with the dots on the left hand side being poorer quality care and those on the right being better quality care. So you can see again huge variations in the quality of care um, across England and uh, Northern Ireland and Wales. We can see that there are big variations around Europe. It's not just within um, the UK, and we're, at the moment so we've just finished a, a study, a European study, looking again at evidence-based care in different centres around different countries in Europe. And you can see 
that there are variations in the time, how quickly people get into hospital, um, quite a range there. The proportion of people who spend more than 50% of their time on a stroke unit and are treated by a multidisciplinary team, again, big variations. And likewise, with access to early antiplatelet therapy, thrombolysis is is rarely given actually anywhere in any great amount. Um, and even variations in access to physiotherapy for people who have significant motor deficits. There are many, there have been in the UK, many initiatives and drivers for change. And this is a, a picture of some of those um, which have actually led to major service improvements. And probably the most important of those was the National Audit Office report published in 2005, which was one of the most critical reports on stroke, uh, on health care that the NAO had ever produced. And that prompted the Department of Health to produce the National Stroke Strategy. And uh, that um, having a major national strategy defining what the quality of care um, should be has been a very important thing for stroke, a disease which has been very much a Cinderella specialty over many years. It's finally put it on the, le on the uh, agenda. Now, when you're considering levers for change for a, a clinical condition, I think it's worthwhile thinking about them in these three ways, at the micro level, the meso level, and the macro level, and in primary care, hospital care, and specialized care. And if you try and populate that sort of graph with what's been done for stroke and what works, then at the micro level, at the management of the patient level, it's in primary care, individual patient review, at hospital care, proper multidisciplinary training of staff, provision of stroke units, and then for specialized care, the hyperacute stroke centers. And working your way through in the meso level, the importance at a hospital level of national audits, providing people with information about what quality of care they're providing, peer review, local and regional strategies, and so on. And I'm not going to go through all that in detail, but there are a lot of drivers for change. And if you actually list all of them, and I don't expect you to read this graph, these are the levers and incentives to deliver high quality care for all, a slide produced by the Department of Health, um, not specific for stroke, but many of these areas do have stroke components within them. Um, you can see that actually the burden on us for trying to encourage us to, to improve the quality of care is actually huge, and probably there are far too many of these. The key forces for change in stroke, I've mentioned already primary research, then putting the, those research evidence all the research evidence into guidelines, and we have in this country produced guidelines from the College of Physicians and NICE, and there have been important NICE technology appraisals. Then there's been national audit, which I'm going to come back to, the National Audit Office report I've mentioned already, and a stroke strategy, and then we have other more local um, things as well. So I'm going to concentrate for the next few minutes on stroke audit because I believe that actually providing the individual clinicians, providing the organizations and providing the patients and the general public with information about exactly what happens to patients um, once they have a particular condition is absolutely critical to improving our standards. So back in 1997, we were commissioned to de develop National Stroke Audit. Um, and that was done at the College of Physicians with a, an intercollegiate working party, a multidisciplinary group, um, who uh, were put together to develop um, audit and guidelines. And ever since then, we have conducted audits every two years, looking at both the structure of services and the processes of care. And it's received funding from various places over the years, currently funded um, by HQIP. It's an audit which has been particularly successful in my view, and that's because it's been run by clinicians. We've managed since the early 2000s to get every single hospital to participate. Um, we get very good data quality and completeness. Um, we analyze the data centrally to uh, get results back to clinicians and to organizations very quickly after the uh, data is submitted, so it is almost real time. 
We provide individual detailed hospital reports and we bench benchmark those reports against the national and the regional averages. And then we produce specific reports for the strategic health authorities and for various other organizations, including the Department of Health and Parliament. And we put out um, press releases and get very extensive media coverage um, on these uh, data um, with a lot of public data being provided as well. So if you go back to 1998, back to the time uh, 90, um, when we accept that services were pretty poor, very few people going through stroke units and very poor quality in terms of very basic assessments um, being done in terms of cognition or um, checking neurological signs. If you then look at what's happened over time, you can see that there have been major shifts in the way that care has been provided. So stroke units in hospital have gone up to 92% uh, across England, Wales and Northern Ireland. It's 100% in England. Um, by 2008 had stroke units. We, uh, and that sort of summarizes that. So providing information of this sort um, has been fairly critical in my view to delivering better quality care. But we still have had, uh, even up into the latest audit, major variations in the, in the delivery of that care. We have, despite providing the evidence, provide, despite having the guidelines, we still have areas of the country, hospitals, where quality of care is very poor. And this graph summarizes that. We've I've got ten, nine key indicators which we use to, as markers of the quality of care, and there are still a significant number of hospitals who only manage to deliver one or two of those key indicators um, for their patients. And it looks even worse if you put care into bundles. And I think bundles of care is quite an interesting way of looking at data like this. And the analogy is that um, if you've got a car that uh, only starts or fails to start once a week, you would very quickly get rid of that car. If you looked at the data and saw that actually it started six times out of seven, you might be thinking slightly differently. But if you put those together and say that actually if you across the week it fails to start every time, you would very quickly recognize that as being a hopeless car. If you're a patient going into hospital, it's not actually good enough that you get your CT scan but you never see a physiotherapist. It's important that you get the whole package of care. And therefore, grouping indicators together um, to show the patients whether or not actually they are getting a comprehensive package of care is a, a useful way of presenting to the data. And this graph summarizes the data from the 2008 audit in terms of the percentage of patients who received all of the nine key indicators, absolutely critical, key, simple things to be done that you would expect to have done if you had a stroke. And over 50% of patients um, within each of the sites had none, none of those patients achieved all nine key indicators. Very, very few hospitals managed to achieve larger percentages than 50% um, of their patients receiving all the key indicators. So this is a way we're going to start presenting the data to make people realize that actually it's not worth focusing on just one particular component of care. If you want to get evidence-based care effectively, you need to look at the entire pathway. So how have we used the data? Well, the, from the audit, we run workshops after each audit. We provide toolkits, slide toolkits for individual clinicians and hospitals to use to be able to present their own data locally. We influence policy at a national level by providing the data to the Department of Health, by sitting on their committees. And indeed, these data are really the most reliable, the only data really, that the Department of Health have to, to describe what's going on at a national level. And I'm a very firm believer that it's very important to get the public behind you in terms of implementing change. And all publicity, in my view, is good publicity. So just one example, this is a... Uh, consultant who wrote in to us after one of the rounds of audit um, saying that she'd been trying to get the trust to offer scanning for patients for five years um, since she'd been appointed as a consultant. Within a day of receiving the audit report, the chief executive had convened a meeting with stroke service and radiology. She'd been invited onto the local radio station 
um, the BBC down in, in the area that she was in had given an interview in which she had struggled to explain why not all her patients were being scanned and being admitted to a stroke unit. By the time she got back to the hospital, actually, those meetings had been convened. So bad publicity can be extremely powerful. We produce peer-reviewed publications, and then these data are used by various people for performance indicators and to identify problem trusts and encourage them to take up peer review. So, transforming care in London, I've recently taken on the role of uh, the clinical director of stroke in London. I'm going to use for the next few minutes a, uh, the example of how change has been delivered in London in the last year in what I think is a very dramatic way. This is the original case for change for London. These, each of these bars on the top line is the percentage of people treated on a stroke unit to the middle line, the percentage of people seen by a physiotherapist within 72 hours, and then emergency brain scanning within 24 hours. And basically the green bars are the ones where you let people are receiving acceptable practice. The red bars are those uh, hospitals that were delivering poor quality care on that audit. So huge variation, a lot of ineffective treatment. And indeed, if you compared the audit results between 2004 and 2006 and 2008, you actually saw that, people were, that some hospitals were actually deteriorating over that time. This is a map of uh, Greater London. On the left-hand side is the, uh, a map with, uh, showing the prevalence of stroke in London, with the paler areas being the lower areas of prevalence and the, higher, the darker areas being the higher prevalence. And so you can see that the highest prevalence of stroke is in, as you would expect, in the suburbs of London, where the, uh, the, the elderly people tend to live in greater numbers. And then the right-hand map um, shows where the, ac the access to, to hospital services, acute hospital services, with the darker red areas being the areas where people had access to greater choice in terms of the hospitals that they could go to. The hospitals, we had some of the best quality care in the country, in London, indeed internationally, and also some of the worst. And as you might expect, the best quality care tended to be in the central London teaching hospitals where the patients weren't. So we had a real dilemma, really, in, in the fact that we were clearly failing to deliver good quality care for the majority of our patients in London, a population of over 8 million people. So we have developed and implemented, over the last year or two, a, a major reorganisation in the way we deliver care. We made a decision that there was no way that we could deliver stroke care, particularly the very acute stroke care, to all patients at all times in every single hospital. It was impractical to staff those hospitals um, 24 hours a day. It was impractical to uh, be able to provide the level of expertise necessary, both within medicine and nursing and therapies, um, to all those hospitals. So a model was developed where it was decided that we would have a limited number of hyperacute stroke units, HAZU, which would be um, available to all patients in London. And the decisions about where those hazards were made, were, were put, was based upon the quality of the bid that they put in, each hospital could bid to provide these services, but also on the geography, with the criterion that everybody should be within a 30 minute travel time of their local hazard. That they would get that hyper-specialist care in one of these hazos for, up to, hazos for up to 72 hours, they would then be transferred to their local hospital, um, their local stroke unit, which also um, people had to bid for, and we went for a smaller number overall of stroke units. So there were some hospitals in London, we started off with 32 stroke units, um, some hospitals which because the quality of care they were promising to offer was not up to it, were told that you would no longer be delivering stroke care at all and then patients discharged into community rehabilitation services with better early support than discharge. Now, there were lots of prophets of doom that it was pe from people who said that it was going to be totally impossible to totally reorganize a service for a condition like stroke um, for a, a population of 8 million. They said that it's 
too complicated, you'd never be able to achieve the staffing requirements. And one of the key things about this whole service reorganization was that it was based upon improving the quality of care. And we set very clear standards, much higher standards than were being delivered before, for all of the components of care. We set minimum staffing levels higher than anywhere else in the country for nursing, doctors, and therapists. We set minimum standards for um, access to imaging in terms of time and so on and so forth. So people said that we'd never be able to achieve the staffing requirements. We were going to have to recruit over 400 extra nurses in London to be able to deliver this care. 100 extra therapists in stroke were going to be needed. People, said that, people then said that patients wouldn't accept being taken to a hospital distant from where they lived, that they would only really prepare to go to a hospital just down the road from them that it wouldn't be possible with London traffic to get people to uh, one of these hazards within 30 minutes. We all know what traffic in London is like, and we were being far too optimistic. They then said that we wouldn't be able to get people moved from the HAZU back to their local stroke unit. We know what it's like in the National Health Service trying to move a patient from one hospital to another. The waiting times are, are too long. The, the HAZUs would very quickly fill up and the whole service would fail. They said that trusts, individual trusts would not accept having services taken away from them like hyperacute care or their stroke unit care and they would take the whole process to judicial review and, and try and block it. And they said that even if the acute services would work, the stroke units would very quickly become clogged up because community services wouldn't be um, changeable to be able to produce the throughput of care of patients that one would need. And if you got all that right, then the services would uh, um, be unsustainable in the long term. Well, what has happened? We've uh, developed a new tariff. Behind all this has been the primary care trusts who have provided additional funding of about £1,000 per patient episode to pay for this improved care. We've made the major workforce and recruitment as, re as we needed. We have robustly assessed all the units and they now meet that, those criteria that we set. We've opened some additional beds, 116 extra beds for hyperacute care and nearly 500 beds are open now in stroke units. We have, if we compare our results in London in the last round of audit um, to the rest of the country, in terms of the, the acute standards for the hyperacute units, the, uh, the London hazards, are the green area, they achieved them in 75% of cases compared to uh, um, only 7% nationally. In terms of can we get our patients to these hazards, um, by ambulance. Um, this is a, a graph across time. Before we started, we implemented starting in February 2010, and by August 2010, over 90% of stroke patients were being taken directly to a hyperacute stroke unit. And the average transit time, travel time, was only 14 minutes from the patient's home to one of these eight hyperacute stroke units. Thrombolysis rates have increased dramatically in the first few months of delivering this new model. Before we started, about 3.5% of patients' unselected admissions in London were receiving thrombolysis. That has now gone up to between 12 and 14% of patients now with stroke are receiving thrombolysis, and that is probably getting on for the correct number, given that a large number of people shouldn't be receiving it for all sorts of contraindications. The uh, bottom graph on the left-hand side, the blue line um, represents London, the purple line, um, the rest of the country. That's the proportion of patients spending more than their 90% of their time on a stroke unit. It's up to over 85% now um, in the London units compared to less than 70% nationally and uh, similar figures for the management of transient ischemic attacks. And in doing that, although we've been spending extra money on all these patients, probably it is cost saving, although we still don't have proper outcome data, it's too early for that. But if you just look at the average length of stay, which is the main driver of cost for stroke care, that has come down um, by a mean of about four days um, since we started. So, we've 
I think are demonstrating that it is possible to take the evidence that we've got for stroke care and implement it for a city as big as uh, London and I think it could be achieved in a similar way for the UK. Is there any evidence that going back and looking at the European data whether we've improved in the UK since then? Well there's another European study that is uh, going on um, that is attempting to do that using these centres here in Lithuania, Poland, uh, Italy, Spain, France and the UK. And if you look at the outcomes um, from this study, um, actually what you can see is that the um, outcomes now in London are right up near the top of the pile. And I think that that is as a result of the work that has been going on from a lot of different agencies, from a lot of different directions in trying to improve care in the UK over the last 10 years. So, in conclusion, stroke care has undergone major improvements over the last 20 years, but we had a long way to come because we started off at such a low level and we by no means have solved the problem nationally. Um, there's still much work to be done. Those changes have been driven by primarily the research evidence showing that stroke is a treatable disease, by getting good quality guidelines and getting those used in the clinical centres, by providing good information to the general public about the quality of care that they have been receiving and public opinion has been a major driver for improvement. By providing additional funding and using the funding that we have got more efficiently by driving down the length of stay and by making stroke a priority and setting targets. Thank you. So if we can now open for some questions. Uh, right at the front. Uh, Tony, warmest congratulations. This is a major achievement, absolutely a landmark achievement. You shared with us some of the strategy use, uh, audits and publicity. But of course, the greatest obstacle often are people obstacle. Can you share with us, off the record, even though it's being filmed, generically, what were some of those main obstructions and how did you overcome them? I think the, the biggest obstruction has right the way through has been the lack of clinical leadership in some senses. If you look at the difference between the successful units and those who have failed to make progress, it's around lack of clinical and actually managerial leadership within those institutions. And that I think has been the most difficult thing to change. And change, and it's probably the reason why there are still some areas of the country that are lagging behind. We are seeing improvements in that area because one of the most important things that happened is that stroke has become recognized as a specialty in its own right and indeed a fairly popular specialty for neurologists and geriatricians to go into. Um, and therefore we are now attracting much better quality people into the specialty. But I think it's going to be another 10 or 15 years before we get decent quality leadership in all of those places. Thank you for the lovely presentation. I'm a GP in London and I've come across two patients who came to see me on a Monday morning having had a TIA on a Friday. I was, and we've got posters of FAST on our waiting rooms and I was thinking mm, if this patient had presented to A&E or call an ambulance, he or she would have been easily thrombolized. Are we exposing a lot of patients who have TIA to unnecessary side effects of thrombolysis? I don't think so actually because TIAs, one can recognize them almost straight away. The, the real TIAs get better within an hour actually. Um, and you're never going to be thrombolizing people in an hour. If, even if they're going to get, even if it's a TIA that's going to go on longer, you'll already be seeing by an hour people um, making rapid improvements and you're not going to thrombolize under those circumstances. So I do not believe that we're thrombolizing a significant number of people um, with transient ischemic attacks. I don't think that's an issue to really. Hello, I'm also a Londoner and I had 
two questions about organisational things. Um, one is I wondered if it made it any easier given for um, to get LAS to take patients not to the nearest hospital given they'd already agreed that for acute coronary syndrome because previously they would always take to the nearest hospital on principle. And secondly, whether it's likely to be any harder in the future if hospitals all become foundation trusts and there's no overarching health authority for London. Well, the first question is that LAS has been one of our greatest supporters, really, and uh, they've been involved in the discussions from the outset and helped to develop the plans, and there's been absolutely no problem in the paramedics in terms of adopting this new strategy. In terms of what's going to happen to the future, I have major concerns. Um, the, the Secretary of State, Andrew Lansley, made it very clear as soon as he came in that he was not keen on what he regarded as being a top-down approach to reorganization of care, and he felt that it should be left up to the market to decide. The fact is that we've had the market um, since time immemorial, really, um, and we've been left with a postcode lottery um, of care. Um, and I think for a condition like this where you cannot afford each and there's, it's strategically impossible really for every hospital to provide the quality of care necessary to deliver some of these hyperacute treatments, you are going to have to have planning done at a much larger population level than GP, individual GP practice, consortia or even you know, groups of consortia. Um, and I do think there needs to be some central direction, but the Secretary of State has put a block on all the other, apart from major trauma and stroke which got in under the wire, we persuaded him that it was already too late to roll it back. Um, that's not to say that he's not going to come along fairly soon and say put a stop to it, I, d I don't know. Um, but some of the other important areas where these sort of organizations, reorganizations were being planned, like for example vascular surgery, um, pediatric cardiology, those sort of things, um, they've been put on hold and I, have re I just don't know how we're going to be able to deal in the future with major change, system reorganization that's going to be necessary within the sort of structure of the health service that is being developed. Now, I may, hopefully I'll be surprised by the flexibility of the new GP commissioning systems, but at the moment I, I, I can't quite see how it's going to uh, pan out. Sorry, Sam, behind you. Sorry, thank you for that. Um, uh, Jan Oster, I'm a GP in Brighton. Uh, Thank you very much. It was a fantastic example of uh, clinical leadership. Um, I am interested in, in, uh, in the prospect of uh, uh, fantastic clinical leaders, uh, capable people uh, uh, competing in their own specialties for uh, dwindling, dwindling resources. And I wanted to ask you, um, you, you mentioned extra funds which you managed to secure for this. Um, probably it's fair to say in the times of plenty. Um, how does uh, the cost of your fantastically improved care now compared to some of the really efficient units we saw uh, we, who were delivering relatively good results for very, very much lower cost. I think that was uh, uh, Florence uh, in Italy. How, how does that compare now? Unfortunately, I can't give you those data yet, and, but with their data which we are collecting and we'll, you know, if we come back in a year or two then maybe I'll be able to tell you. Um, I don't think, I mean, we've, we're putting an extra about £20 million a year in London into stroke care. It is not going to take very much in terms of savings of, of bed stay or, of, you know, not that many people not ending up going into long-term institutional care to be able to save that money. Um, we need to get the sums right and do it, and we need to uh, be looking at other models of care. I'm not arguing that this is the only model of care that is suitable, and certainly if you look, the geography, for example, will determine hugely what sort of model of care you use, and if you go around the country now, there are different models being developed using telemedicine and so on and so forth. Um, to adapt to the geography. We're going to have to look at different models for different places. We're going to have to do the costings. We're going to have to be prepared to redesign our services. I mean, if London doesn't turn out to be as effective as one of the other models and turns out to be more expensive, then we need to be flexible enough to change. So if we can just have one final question. 
Hello, I'm, I'm Guru Jampet from the Norwegian Knowledge Center for the Health Services. And we have uh, published an updated uh, Cochrane review on the effects of audit and feedback on health on healthcare. Um, and um, uh, it, it, it has inclu included over 150 now randomized controlled trials on the effect of audit and feedback. And it shows uh, uh, um, a mean improvement of only 5% in, in the randomized control trials. Uh, we tried to explore the very big variation between the studies in, in the effects and found that um, uh, the, the most important factor to explain this difference is the baseline compliance. So if you had a low baseline compliance, you improved more. So I just wonder, could you see any such uh, difference in effect across your, uh, your audit or across the different areas that the, the, um, the areas that had the lowest quality improved more than the others? Um, unfortunately, no. I mean, we have looked at that, and there, there doesn't seem to be a particular pattern. Um, there are, there's huge variability. So you'll see hospitals who have been sitting at the bottom of the dung heap for the last 10 or 15 years, really, in terms of quality, um, not really making any change. Um, and then other hospitals which have shown steady improvement. And of course, it's quite difficult to improve um, if you start right up at the top. So I, it's... It is, uh, I can't say that that is necessarily the pattern that we found um, in the UK. So if we can bring this session to a close, thanking Dr. Hughes and Professor Ridigan.